Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. In today's episode, we have Afif Ghanoum and Dr. Mahmoud Ghanoum here to talk about their research in the space of the mycobiome, the fungi that work in conjunction with our bacteria to keep us healthy when they're in the right balance. Super fascinating interview. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep in the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, mindset, and more. I'm your host, Drew Perode, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest, our father and son team, Dr. Mahmoud Ghanoum and Afif Ghanoum. Welcome to Broken Brain Podcast. Thanks Thank for having you. us. A little background on my guests that are here. Dr. G is a tenured professor and director of the Center for Medical Mycology at Case Western University and University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. He spent his entire career studying medically important fungi and publishing extensively about their virtuous factors, especially in microbial biofilms. Dr. G is the scientist that named and coined the term the mycobiome, the fungal community in the body. Over his career, Dr. G has published over 450 peer-reviewed papers, and his work has been cited in over 21,000 pieces of literature. He has been actively funded by the NIH continuously since 1991 for his work studying the fungal and bacterial communities in our bodies, with a total of over 25 million in NIH funding to date. Dr. G was dubbed the scientist who is now known as the leading microbiome researcher in the world by the Washington Post and is also the founder of the leading antifungal clinical testing company in the world, Next Trillion Sciences. He has been involved in the development of 95% of antifungals that have come to the market since the 19. 90s. Impressive bio. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, you are too kind. Yes. Afif is a biotechnology attorney by training who turned biotechnology innovations into consumer products that have sold in over 27,000 retail locations in the United States. He has also licensed the technology to the global pharmaceutical company that has now sold in over 100,000 retail locations. Afif is currently the CEO of Biome Health, where he has commercialized consumer probiotics and microbiome testing kits around the dual role that fungi and bacteria play in the digestive tract. Afif, a pleasure to have you and your father here on the podcast. Thanks for having us. I know we've been in touch and just the work that you guys are doing together and separately is incredible. And I'm so excited because we've done so many podcasts on the gut microbiome from all different standpoints, including many of our mutual friends that we've had on the podcast here. But this time, not that we're not going to dive deep into the microbiome, but we're going to be talking about this term that is still very new for a lot of people, the mycobiome. So let's start with that, right? So there's so many pieces to the gut microbiome, and as we dig deeper and deeper, we realize that it's even more complex than we can, eat, we can ever imagine. So what is the mycobiome, and what's its relation to our gut bacteria? I think this is very, very nice uh, point to bring up to, because up till now, a lot of the work, when you hear about the microbiome, you hear about bacteria. But in fact, in addition to the bacteria, in, in and on our body, we have fungus, which is mycobiome, MY. MY, as well as viruses and other organisms as well, such as parasites. So my work, as you said, is the mycobiome. And mycobiome is all over us. Like you can find fungus in our skin, in our oral cavity, in our gut. And for years, this have not been recognized. The good news is that people now started to know that we have both bacteria and fungus, and that's where we play a, lo a role in really clarifying this and how to control this. So we've known about why it's important for the microbiome, but why are people starting to know now, especially through your research, about why fungi and the microbiome is so important? Because if you think about it, they bacteria and fungus, they live in the same environment. And 
they are like little kids playing in a sandbox. Sometimes they come work together, sometimes to help us, sometimes to help themselves, and sometimes to hurt us as hosts. So for us, I knew that organisms such as bacteria and fungi lived together long time ago, when I first started to do my doctorate in England in, uh, in the 70s. What I learned is that if you give somebody an antibiotic, guess what happens? You kill all the bacteria and lo and behold, fungus or the microbiome takes over and start causing trouble. And that's why we are trying to bring now, after so many years, we are trying to let people be aware that we really need to look at both bacteria and fungus because when they play together, they could be good to us or they could be bad to us. Afif, you know, when you are, you're on the business side of this in creating consumer technologies and solutions to help educate people. So I'm sure you get this question all the time. So to piggyback off of what your dad was just sharing, when you give the elevator pitch to individuals about why is it so important to understand the microbiome and aren't they the same thing? What are the distinctions that you like to share with people to get them interested in this topic? Why is it so important? Yeah. The thing is it can get into the weeds really quickly. And obviously when you're talking to consumers, it has to be something that they understand. And really the simplest way to explain it is, listen, your gut has bacteria and fungi, really your probiotic should too. Your microbiome tests should cover both, right? And the thing is that people don't understand is that for every, uh, you, you'll hear a lot of people say that, well, there's a lot more bacteria in the gut than fungi. But if you see a picture of the two together, it's like Gulliver's Travel where you, the fungi is about 10 times bigger in size than, than bacteria. So really what you're doing, if you're not addressing both bacteria and fungi, and it is about both of them, is that you're really ignoring one of the major kingdoms in the body. And what, what the research has found, and this is what my father was a scientist that discovered that it's not just that there's bacteria and fungi in the gut, but they actually work together and sometimes very destructively. So if you're ignoring this entire kingdom, you're really not balancing your total microbiome. So let's go back to this idea, this fundamental idea that's really shown up in the last few years, at least at the population level. There's been researchers that have known about this, functional medicine doctors that have known that, hey, there's there's good bacteria, not all bacteria is bad. So same thing with fungi, is that there's some that are beneficial and there's some that are not beneficial, right? That's absolutely true. What happens when they get out of balance? What are some of the implications that can happen in our body when we have too much of the bad and not enough of the good when it comes to fungi? That's really a good point to, tr to try to clarify. If fungi is present, as you say, at low numbers, then in fact, it could be beneficial. What happens if it overgrows, that's where the problems start to happen. And you will start having gastrointestinal issues, you start to having inflammation, and you start to really be affected at different levels in your body because the studies have been shown that in addition to bacteria, also fungi can affect our mood, for example. So that's why it's good to look at both of them and try to see, we need really to keep them at bay. Otherwise, as you, as you were alluding to, they start causing us more and more issues and become, we are less and less well. Yeah, and I think it's a, a misnomer. One of the things we always tell people is that, you know, everybody concentrates on, well, how do I get rid of the bad? How do I get rid of the bad? It's really about keeping uh, homeostasis with all the organisms because take Canada, about half of us have Canada as a natural colonizer. It has actually a very good role to play when it's in check. The problem is if things go off and Canada does come out of control, then it can have some negative effects. But Canada in and of itself can actually have a positive role. What are some of the roles that you've always told me? Like, on, yeah, like for ex yeah, well, one of the things like, for example, when they are in the right proportion and imbalance, they can break some of the carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates. And to give simpler byproduct of these uh, carbohydrates, which bacteria can use. And then bacteria can make it even simpler, which allow fungi to grow. So they basically work together to not only both of them grow well, but also they give products, they make these complex carbohydrates simpler for us as hosts to absorb. So we'll have better absorption. So in a way, we really need it at that level because we are gonna have better digestive system and better absorption of nutrients.
What's an example of a health condition, symptom, or disorder that's often linked to or connected to, let's say, the example of high amounts of candida, for example, or candida, as some people call yes. it? I mean, the simplest one, which everybody will, uh, will know, is the thrush, for example. When you have a little baby, they have in their mouth uh, candida thrush. You have this white lesions there. Women have a lot of, uh, when you have imbalance in candida, they have vaginal candidiasis, uh, which is uh, the yeast disease. Yeast infections. Cause, yeast infections. So these are one of the most uh, important, uh, sort of easy to understand. Yeah, and, and a lot of times people with autoimmune disorders will have, again, the way, the way to think about it is if anything rocks your system and kind of suppresses your immune system, you're going to have an issue, right? And, and a lot of times people don't realize how on the verge, one of the, we love talking about this, is that we, in our gut testing, we see thousands and thousands of different samples. And we saw this cohort of women that had this very aggressive type of fungi called zygomycota growing out of control. So initially when we said to dad, well, what do you think? He said, might be undiagnosed immune compromised situation. So like maybe cancer, HIV, but there was enough of a cluster that we went and looked a little deeper. And what we found was they were cutting out almost all their carbs, all their dairy. And because they're really impacting the prebiotic environment of the GI, it was allowing this very aggressive type of fungi to grow. Why? Because something on their system was probably, you know, compromised. So it, a lot of times it's it's got to do with if your system's under a tremendous amount of stress, that's when we see fungi typically growing out of whack. That's why a lot of the time I call fung fun fungal infections are the diseases of the immunocompromised. If your immunity is low, if you are taking antibiotics, if you are a transplant patient, for example, you are more likely to the to get the disease. If your immunity is really good, then you are fine. I tell you the first time I did an experiment with mice to try to see how we can help them if they have fungal infections, when we uh, treated them with an anti antifungal, they were all over the place. They were so happy. Even sometimes without treatment, because they ha their immunity is intact, they were able to clear the disease. So. Fungi is a problem when it goes out of control. So let's talk about antibiotics because that's one of the things that you've been raising the alarm on that we've been through this generation of over prescribing of antibiotics. There's antibiotics in our food systems that's there too. We've had podcasts in the past talking about the damage that an antibiotics can cause in our uh, bacterial microbiome. What kind of uh, damage can antibiotics create uh, when it comes to the microbiome? What happens when you take an antibiotic? Somebody goes, they have an infection, they take an antibiotic. What you are doing is you are killing both good and bad bacteria. The bacteria that infect you as well as the one which really is beneficial to you. So by doing this, you are giving the chance for fungi to grow. Like candida, is under control because of these beneficial organisms. When they go, then it becomes out of it can control. Go, get loose. It get loose and start attacking. Yeah, it's like antibiotics are microbiome's best friend because they get rid of the guys keeping them under control and they allow the fungi to go bananas. That's why a lot of times, like that was saying, you'll see women have you know yeast infections because all of a sudden the fungi is just not kept in check. So that right. can happen from like immunosystem or obviously antibiotics, something that's just destroying that colonized bacterial community. And in the case of the yeast infections, any woman that's gone through it or any partner of theirs that knows that they might go in and they might get a recommendation for an antibiotic or antifungal in this case, but back in the day, it was also surprising that people would give them antibiotics. People used to get antibiotics for cold from their doctor, even if they right. wasn't right. related to bacteria that was right. there, even if it was viral. So there was a lot of misinformation. There was a lot of overprescribing. So they might, and the other component is a lot of people save their antibiotics or save their z packs. They get some sort of infection, they're self treating, and they'll just say, Oh, I have a little bit of strep throat, I think, but they're not sure. I have a yeast infection. They'll just take the antibiotics on their own without checking with anybody. And then that can cause larger damage inside the system. Well, well and we're seeing it now with uh, Canada Oris, which is this, the first fungal uh, strain that's dr drug resistant. And dad has widely talked about this, that the fact that it, a lot of it's probably tied to the food system. 
You know, that's so very interesting because up till now, again, it's like not many, many people f uh, heard of the fungal community. Not many people heard of the resistance in fungi. We all know about the resistance in bacteria, but now we are starting to see, to see that. To, so much so that this new uh, fungus, as Afif mentioned, Candida auras, because it was isolated in the ears of a Japanese uh, patient, is multi-drug resistant to all antifungals available, available in the market, which really is very unique. We did not see this up till now. Incredible. So let's talk about, let's let, lay a little bit more groundwork. What are biofilms and what role do they play when it comes to the mycobiome? Let me first tell you what is a biofilm. And I'm sure Afif maybe can say a little bit more where people can understand it better than I described. I think everybody's understanding <laughs> you great right now. <laughs> so what happens, organisms, when they want to infect, the first thing they do is they stick to your tissue or they stick to your gut, gut lining, okay? And then they start to produce this slimy material to protect themselves as if you have jello and inside the jello you have all these M&Ms or raisins. So the raisins are the fungi or the bacteria for that matter. And the jello which is covering them is what we call the matrix. Now, why this is important? Because once they do this, they become in a, a protected environment. Antibiotics cannot get rid of them, antifungal cannot get rid of them, and even our immune system cannot reach them. So our studies showed that in Crohn's disease patients, we found that bacteria and fungi, they come together and they start to form these biofilms, and we call them digestive plaque, okay? Right. The nice, uh, also interesting thing is other people now are starting to see these biofilms, not just in Crohn's uh, patients, but in people with colorectal cancer or even diabetic wounds. So having a biofilm which made of pathogenic organism or bad microbes is not good news. Right, so you have a bad fungi or bacteria and we'll talk about how they develop these biofilms and how they get stronger, but essentially they have a force field around them. Yes. And they have a natural one. So naturally, it's a defense mechanism. It's a protection mechanism. But there's something happening today that's creating almost super fungi and super bugs. So what's happening today that's causing them to have these unpenetrable shields from even our own immune system? What's causing, like we know that we've heard the term of like, antibiotic resistant bacteria and that can often come from like hospital environments that are ultra 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 clean yes and using a lot of antibiotics and then you get us you can develop a super bug that's happening in the hospitals that can cause like c difficile or other challenges is that the similar thing that's happening with our fungi with fungi what what happens is because we are using so many uh indwelling catheters for example so many plastics in our body. These fungi, they come and stick to the plastic and they start, which, which we say they adhere. And then once they adhere, they start to produce this and they become a big problem where it is responsible for up to 25% mortality rate in hospitals. So it is having a biofilm infection is not a good news. And really there is a great efforts uh, we and uh, uh, as you know, my team in, uh, was involved in this and was funded by NIH to try to see how can we first understand how these biofilm form, and then can we find things that can get rid of them. Understood. What are what are other things? Are there other things that cause these biofilms to form? Yeah, and, and just as like some context too, people will oftentimes want to say, "Oh, I've never heard of biofilm." We say, "You actually have like dental plaque. That's a biofilm." Right. right, And so when you're trying to get rid of that plaque on your teeth, it's not the biofilm plaque that's the issue. It's, as you said, it's this force field per protecting these pathogenic organisms against your gums, right? So what we're seeing is that that sort of... Um, the force matrix. field. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that matrix, matrix is really becoming more prominent all over the body. And a lot of it's to do with even in, in the uh, agricultural system, there's a lot of pesticides, a lot of antifungals that are getting passed into the food system, which is so going could, to have an effect. Could too much over usage of antifungals create a stronger biofilm on a fungi? It may, it may create an organism which is more resistant 
right. to uh, uh, antifungal. But then also it may ra- rev their virulence factor. Like for example, if you uh, if you have candida, let's say the simplest example, you have candida, it's in the gut, we kill the bacteria, we give it a chance to, st- to start to grow and wear it stick to our gut lining, you know, ep- the epithelial layer there. Once it sticks there, it starts to change its form, its form. Like instead of becoming like baker's yeast, you know, like round, it becomes like thread, it becomes filament. And these filaments, they start to invade our gut lining and cause damage. Yeah, you will literally see on the electron microscopy these filaments, which are basically like them latching in to the gut lining. Like that's one of the things when you talk about leaky gut, that's exactly what's happening. You will actually see in this 5,000X electron microscopy, organisms going through the gut lining. And really, it does not have, I gave you the example at the beginning of biofilms, they stick to catheters, but also they stick to our tissues, like for example, the gut lining, or in st- certain extreme cases where candida go through the gut and start invading the kidney, for example, we look at, if you look at the kidney, you find all these white batches on it, which are biofilms there forming in the tissue. So it does not have to be an inanimate object. It really can grow also in our tissue and start causing problems. So what's the repercussions of all these biofilms and their increasing amount in our bodies worldwide? What's the repercussions of it in our own body and our own health? I mean, repercussion is if you don't control them, they will start, as I said, maybe breaking down our gut lining and start causing systemic infection. That's why it's very important to control them. Now, there is something which I want to say also, but there are some good biofilms. Not all of them are bad. Right, there's it's some the, that are in our mouth that are also good. Yes. And like that, there's some in our, on our gut. gut that are also yes, good. Yes, because these are may, uh, formed by the beneficial microbes. And this is good because in a way, these biofilms try to protect our lining, uh, gut lining. So. In cases, if these pathogenic organisms, the bad ones that they come together, then we have a problem and we need to get rid of them. The other thing they'll do is biofilms will actually inhibit nutrient absorption because they're literally lining the gut. And it, they do two things. One, they act as a physical barrier to nutrients going through the GI lining, but also these organisms actually scavenge nutrients. So it's kind of like a double edged sword when it comes to nutrient like absorption. Like a parasite that's stealing your uh, Yeah, it literally. Your yeah, 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 yeah. So. <laughs> That's why as much as possible, you just want to be able to eradicate those pathogenic biofilms. What did the understanding of biofilms, how has that more broadened the the understanding of how to treat people's health? So now that we know that biofilms are more prevalent and that more people are uh, facing them and that there's good and bad ones, once we start to understand that, how can we begin to approach gut health in a different way. So, w- Do you mind? yeah, so let me take a step back. When he did his, his big clinical trial on Crohn's patients in 2016, and he really found that bacteria and fungi were causing these biofilms that for Crohn's patients was causing just these severe side effects. What people started asking very naturally, well, is there a probiotic you recommend? Is there an antifungal you recommend? How do I, how do I get a control of this? And when we looked in the market, no one had tried to address not just the dual role of bacteria and fungi, but biofilm specifically. So you're throwing all these probiotics in, but like that said, if you have a strong biofilm, even antibiotics are not able to break that down. So we said, you know, really, if you're gonna address this, you need to break down that biofilm matrix. And so that's what we thought was really the approach to taking that holistic total approach to gut health was you have to really inhibit these specific organisms causing that biofilm matrix. And what we did to to reach that goal is we did what you call correlation analysis. We tried to look at what organisms can inhibit the the bad bugs like E. coli, Serratia marcescens, and Candida. And what organisms can play with them very well. And based on this, we found a subset of probiotic strains, which is both bacteria and fungus, that when you put them together, as well as you add an enzyme, which breaks down some of this matrix or some of, as you say, protective layer, we were able to show that using this, we destroyed the biofilm, both 
in uh, in vitro. Also, we showed it in the gut of animals where you treat it with these uh, strains and the enzyme, it becomes completely clear. And this work, we published it in April of this year. Incredible. Uh, so we're going to talk more about like the practical implications of it, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into the the, the microbiome. So I, I've read that you guys said it can take months or years to shift your gut bacteria in a significant way, but you can alter your gut fungi profile for better or for worse in just 24 hours. Tell yes. us more about that. So this really based on a study by a professor called Hoffman. He published a paper and he put people on diets and tried to see how fast you can change the a microbiome, both the bacteria and the fungus. The the myco or the the the, the microbiome, the myco, fungal microbiome, community, the fungal, yeah, community. The, the fungal community. But he also looked at the bacterial community as well. Right. And what he found is that the microbiome, the fungal components, can change very fast, and that's why he called it short-term diet. You can change it by short-term diet. When he looked at the bacteria. It took forever to try to change, and that's why he said it, to try to change it, you need long-term diet. That's why our ability to change the microbiome quickly is beneficial to us, which will help us rebalance the gut. Why do you think, just zooming out big picture, you know, they have this harmonious relationship where our bacteria and our fungi play together to keep things in harmony for their own benefit and then our benefit too. But why do you think it's so easy? Like what's the purpose inside the body to be able to modify our microbiome, our fungi community so quickly? Like why are they so susceptible to immediate dietary changes? What's the benefit to that? The benefit to them is that they can respond very fast. Like it is the fun fungus very is very smart. Why? Because you give them food, they can change very, very quickly their metabolism and they use it faster. Whereas with the bacteria, it, took, it takes longer to do that. And do they have different roles and duties? Like coming back to the basics of it, are there things that our fungi are doing in our body that we can isolate that's different than our bacteria are doing? Oh, sure. There are, as I mentioned, one example, which we said, like uh, fungi can break the complex carb, but bacteria can break the simpler one. Mm. Okay. Also, if you have a good, we, are, we always talk about the bad one, the candida, but if you have Saccharomyces boulardii, for exa example, or Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the Baker's yeast, what we found is that it, in the gut, it really antagonizes the bad uh, bugs. So in, it secretes uh, uh, antifungals, which can kill candida. So it can keep it under control. That's why for our gut, we need more Saccharomyces and less Candida, relatively speaking. Yeah, sometimes when people go to uh, India or Mexico or another country where they're not used to like the bacteria, the fungi that's there, they get, you know, in India they call it deli belly, yes. right? Where they get <laughs> diarrhea. And often one treatment for that that a lot of functional medicine doctors have, in addition to personalizing it for what the person's going through, is they'll give them Saccharomyces boulardii this yeast yeah, eating, non-colonizing bacteria to help them break down the fungi that they picked up that they weren't used to, to address that. I think this is very smart because there are even studies to show that Saccharomyces boulardii can inhibit uh, antibiotic associated diarrhea, for example, or diarrhea, which, you, which could be, you give somebody antibiotic and then guess what? We have a lot of candida overgrowth, which will then stimulate release of water, potassium, and calcium. Having Saccharomyces boulardii will stop that because it will control candida and then you really recover. So the, uh, this absolutely true uh, and helpful, as you said, in, in, in deli symptom, belly. <laughs> <laughs> deli belly. Or in Mexico, sometimes they refer to it as Montezuma's Mont revenge. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if that's, I don't know if any of this is politically correct or not. I'm just using the right. terms that people use for it. So, and I've recommended to a few friends before uh, with great, uh, with great results. So let's come back to diet and the role that our diet plays. We talked about how our diet can impact our fungi in a short period of time. Let's talk about the things that can have maybe some of the bad fungi grow or fungi. Do you have a preference on people if people say fungi or fungi? It's, it's the same. It's the same. It just depends on the accent. <laughs> yes. So one of the things that my uh, people like my business partner, Dr. Mark Hyman, talks about, they're big advocates for cutting down sugar inside the diet. Yes. Right? 
So we often hear that, especially when it comes to Canada or Candida, that one of the things that can flourish bad levels of yeast in the body is sugar. Is that true? Absolutely. So what's happening when we have sugar or high amounts of sugar in our diet, added sugar, and why do our the yeast in our body and the fungi like it so much? First of all, it's easier for them to assimilate and grow, you know, but definitely if you have uh, sugar, high levels of it, you are sure to increase your growth of, of uh, candida in your gut. So it's like we call it sugar loving microbe because of this, you know. Now, there are other things which could, uh, I, I would say this is the number one maybe factor in the diet that will encourage the most growth of candida. But there are other other stuff which can also affect it. For example, if you have processed uh, food, uh, sweeteners, you know, we actually did a study where we not only looked at candida, but we, when we had artificial sweeteners, uh, we f fed the mice uh, the, that, and guess what? We were able to see that there is a shift in bacteria, protobacteria, which is a pro-inflammatory uh, organism. It's a so red increased flag. sugar in the diet of these mice created more inflammation it, in the body. It definitely it created uh, more inflammation, and that's why really, one of the bad stuff is uh, artificial sweeteners, for example, as well as sugars. And uh, apart from that, you know, other other factors, of course, these are the main ones. But if you have red meat, for example, uh, it also encourage the imbalance or what we call dysbiosis on the microbial flora. Now, what's the mechanism in red meat? Because it's a, a time where, you know, there's a lot of debate and discussion on nutrition. So what's the mechanism or what's happening with red meat specifically that is causing, that is being linked to or correlated to uh, disruption in the mycobiome? I think and does it distinguish between grass-fed or not grass-fed? <laughs> I mean, look, the major pro uh, issue with the red meat is the high fat content, a lot of high fat content, which really encourages the growth of microorganisms in our gut that are bile, bile tolerant. They love the bile tolerance, so they grow very well in the presence of high fat from the meat, and that will lead to the growth of microbes like that, which are pro-inflammatory, which they, in other words, they cause uh, inflammation. Whereas if you try and use, let's say you want proteins, take proteins from fish, for example, is not gonna do the same. And that's, that's really the main thing with respect to the microbiome and the high fat diet. And so that's meat. animal uh, meat that we're talking about. Yes. What about high fat diet from vegetable sources? You know, a study was done where it showed high fat diet from vegetables do not encourage the growth of these bile, bile loving organisms, which are inflammatory compared to the high fat diet. So this was published a study where it shows basically if you take high fat from plant source is not bad at all. We just recently had, uh, I don't know if you guys are connected with him, but uh, Kieran Krishnan yeah. from Microbiome Labs. Yes. And one of the things he talked about is that he had just completed a study that they're gonna be publishing at some point in time about the saturated fat in coconut oil. Yes. And how, even though we were told like coconut oil is great, great, there's a lot of benefits for it. He saw some early signs that it could be leading to endotoxemia in the body because large amounts of saturated fat could be causing disruption, which could create more intestinal permeability. Any sure. thoughts or comments on that inside the space? Or I, I really think uh, that's one of the things which we advocate that you should have monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. If you take uh, such high uh, saturated fatty acids is not good because definitely it can affect the balance of the microbiota. So one one follow-up question uh, that's there is that we see now a growth in the movement of uh, carnivore diet, right? And that's people who, for my podcast listeners who are not familiar, these are individuals who are just literally getting rid of all vegetables, all fruits and eating you know, 95% or more of their diet is coming from uh, meat. And, you know, I know some individuals that are, that are on it, and often these people found their way to the carnivore diet because of severe gut dysbiosis. They were having severe bloating, 
they've tried a lot of different sort of repair processes or gut things, but they continue to react to uh, the carbohydrates in, in vegetable foods and other things like that. So they've ultimately found their way to a very high protein, high fat diet. And anecdotally, it seems that some people are getting some benefit from mm. it. That's there. Just anecdotally, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm sure we need yeah. some studies on it. Any thoughts as to why in the short term some people might be getting benefits from things like the carnivore uh, diet? Sometimes, sometimes if you just eat a lot of vegetables, fibers, and this sort of thing, definitely it will cause bloating. So that's why, in a way, if you want to shift your diet, you should start really slowly, slowly incre increasing the fiber. Now, to me, I am not an advocate of going all all meat, okay, or for that matter, all carbohydrate. I think our body requires car carbs, requires proteins, requires fat. So the secret is which one you want to select, the right ones. If you select the right ones, then you are gonna nourish your uh, gut microbiome, both bacteria and fungi, and this is gonna have a good effect in your body. Yeah, and one example I'll give, we were helping a, a former UFC fighter who was having, you know, cut, cut out of marble, severe digestive issues. And we said, are you, you know, talk to us about your vegetable, you know, plant-based part of your diet. Oh, no, no, every time I, I start going heavy with that, I start having serious digestive issues, I can't do it. You know, I'm doing a lot of keto. And, and what we finally got him to understand was, no, no, no your, your body needs time to shift. Right, so it likely will feel uncomfortable when you're starting to really, especially when you go heavy. And the problem is, a lot of people go extremes one way or the other. If they're going from you know carnivore diet and all of a sudden they're going plant based, it's completely plant based. Going back to those women I was telling you with the zygomycota, they were completely, almost completely cutting out carbs, dairy. And the reality is, it, it, it's it's a boring answer, but it, it's all about sort of middle path, right? Like you you just got to be reasonable. A lot of these things. It's all moderation. And again, going back to it, a lot of people will assume they're having a bad reactions to more plant-based diet. They're just not giving their system long enough to get used to it. And they really have to start like very minimally and build out over a couple of months. But there could be some cases in the instance of like, a, you know, a lot of people come to our clinic, functional medicine doctor's office, you know, they might be dealing with something like SIBO. Small exactly. intestinal bacteria yeah, yeah, overgrowth yeah, yeah. where yeah. they are genuinely yes. having a reaction totally different. to yeah. certain types of- yes. Yes. Foods. The same we have, you have SIBO and uh, SIFO, which is uh, right. small intestinal fungal overgrowth. Right. I think one way, I mean, clearly this is very complex area. You cannot just say, okay, I'll, as I said, you'll go in one way, not, in the, not the other. I think moderation is the way. Also, you need to look at other lifestyles, you know, like for example, we, f we had a, a, a lady in our trial, we, she had complete dysbiosis. We ask, we collect questionnaire from her, what she eats, she eats perfect, like from my, our point of view. Then when we looked at the questionnaire more and more metadata, what we found, she is highly stressed, very stressed, extreme stress she signed, you know, she uh, ticked. So you need to address those issues in addition to your diet. Food is only one piece of the puzzle. It's one piece of the puzzle. Which I couldn't agree yes. more with. So when it comes to the, the mycobiome and really putting the highlight on how important these fungi are, what are some foods, you were talking earlier about somebody who was eating perfectly, but also thought they were removing foods that uh, were not good for them, but that might have unintended consequences that are there. So foods that traditionally sometimes get a bad rap, again, there's personalization that's there, but carbs, dairy products, soy, how sometimes this might explain why some people get benefits from those foods. What's yes. the relationship of those foods and how they could have a positive impact on the microbiome? You see, when we say carbs, it's really a very big category. Right, so it could mean are, anything from like highly processed yeah, yeah. things to <laughs> a piece of broccoli. And even, even you have some digestible carbs and indigestible carbs. Yes. In other words, some, uh, let, let's say the simple sugar stuff, they are digestible. You eat them, you, 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 they break down in your intestine and they change maybe to give you energy and some, uh, you know, uh, help. The other type of diet which is gonna help your gut is the indigestible, like resistant starch, resistant starch. like fiber, okay? Yeah. 
because these are not broken down in our intestine. They go all the way to the colon, and then in the colon, who is happy? The microbes. The microbes are there, and they start to break it down. And by breaking it down, especially the beneficial organism doing that, they are producing good metabolites like short chain fatty acids. And, and just for is, context, can you give our listeners an example of something that is in that category of food that's in the indigestible cards, carbs yes. that our gut bacteria and our fungi love? Like for example, uh, bananas. If you take bananas, which is unripened, don't take it away till it becomes all uh, dotted black in the outside. You it's know? unripened, you want us to take it's the green better, bananas. Not, not, not quite, not quite. But, but not fully brown. Not fully brown, oh, yeah, okay. okay. So that's one thing. Oats, for example, is very good. You have lentils, they have also uh, good stuff like that. So there are a lot of categories which the people, sweet potatoes, for example, is good also. Right. Yeah. So these foods, they're important because why? When they make it down to our colon and the bacteria engage with them and the fungi, what benefit do they give to us? What benefit is that when they take them, basically they use them as a food source because our body did not break them, they can break them. Once they break them, they start to produce small molecules we call metabolites, okay? Such as short chain fatty acids, like for right. example, one of them butyrate. Okay, these are m m small compounds that when they are uh, taken in the blood, they will really help us with respect to the inflammation, with respect to uh, gut uh, brain access, for example, it improves this sort of thing. So that, this is the benefit. The benefit is you are gonna help the beneficial bacteria to grow and give you byproducts which are gonna be good for our health. Yeah, and I think that's really, when you look at that, it's about making the conversation more broad than just what probiotic strains are in my GI, what bad strains are, and it's really about building the ecosystem in the gut through building a very probiotic-friendly environment. You do that through prebiotic-friendly uh, foods, that sort of thing. So it's not so much always about optimizing to these specific strains, it's about creating a almost like topsoil, topsoil for your gut. How much does our genetic background, you know, we've talked about how yeah. there's a new term out like, don't eat like a paleolithic ancestor, eat like yeah. your great grandfather, or grandmother, yeah. <laughs> because you're going to share a similar gut microbiome. Yeah. So what was their diet like? Where were they from? What's their country of origin? If your family isn't from the equator or from, you know, India or other countries that had traditionally maybe a lot more coconut, maybe you should think twice about having a lot of coconut inside your diet. So when it comes to the microbiome, the fungi, how much does our genetic lineage play a role or not play a role? I think if you look at it, maybe a little bit bigger picture, like Crohn's disease, for example. Crohn's disease, it's the genetics, it's the immune dysregulation, as well as the microbiome. So genetics definitely play some role, okay? If you are, if your genetic affecting your immunity, then definitely it's going to be in favor of fungus. Okay? If you have some autoimmune disease, for example, which is caused by uh, genes, you know, what you, whatever you inherited from your uh, parents. Or the expression of those genes, the, the epigenetics of those genes. That, definitely, if they are exactly, the expression is uh, uh, overexpressed, for example, then you may have this sort of uh, autoimmune disease. And like, for example, we've been looking at psoriasis, like which is nothing yes. to do with the gut, but psoriasis in the skin. And we found, we are finding that because of this autoimmune disease, we are seeing both a change in the microbiome in bacteria as well as in fungus. Mm. So definitely genetics could, could maybe not cause it, but could be a uh, contributing factor for fungi to increase. And do you see variation genetically based on fungi? You know, we ta already talked about how like fungi is very quickly influenced. Yeah. Within 24 hours, you know, your diet can inf influence your fungi. But do you see people from different parts of the world have different makeup of their fungi? You know, this is a very good question. I tell you, my Center for Medical Mycology, which I uh, do uh, a lot of clinical trials for uh, companies to do, evaluate their antifungals, we acted as a global, uh, basically, lab for samples coming from all over the world. And when you look at it, fungal samples, like for example, people who have nail infections, we got samples from India, we got samples from Europe, we of course from the US, and you find, and sometimes uh, we got samples from Japan. You will find some differences, 
like in certain places, like for example, in India, I know there is Candida tropicalis is very high. The incidence of that is very high in there. When you look in the US, the number one cause is Candida albicans. So followed by Candida glabrata, you know, so, so there are some uh, variations, variation, but not huge variation, I would say. Got it. So everybody always brings us back to, so what do we do about it, right? So I'd love to talk about both solutions that you guys have been working on because, you know, um, well, 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 I'll get into why, both solutions you guys have, but also coming back to diet, if we really wanna take care of the fungi community and keep it in check, yes. right? Yes. Not have it completely disappear because that's bad, but not have too much overgrowth because that's bad in terms of the outcomes that are there. We already talked about sugar as being one of the number one things that can have the bad fungi grow. What are the things that we can do and that we can focus on that we all have control over that can create that healthy re relationship of fungi and bacteria in our body? What should we be eating more of? Very good question. I think what we should be eating more whole food, obviously. We need to have protein sources from plants, for example, or if you want from animals, a chicken or fish, for example, is also a good source. You need to have fibers because again, remember when they are together, bacteria and fungi, we need to help to help uh, the uh, beneficial bacteria to keep candida under control. So having fiber resistant starch is gonna help it. You know, uh, if you, uh, in addition, there are other, other things which you can take. Like for example, we know candida is associated with infl inflammation. So if you take uh, 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 ginger, for example, is good. Turmeric is, is very good. Garlic is great. In fact, I published this uh, published maybe three years in the effect of garlic, uh, three articles, sorry, in the effect of garlic on the uh, candida. So all of this can, can help very much. If you are having some issues, having a probiotic that has both, uh, that has, for example, Saccharomyces boulardii, as I man mentioned, will be also uh, helpful. Now, with respect to candida, something which have been uh, shown in literature, if you have some deficiency in vitamins, uh, A, B, and C, so it's good to, get, to have food that have these vitamins as well, or multivitamin, for example. And what role do those vitamins play when it comes to candida, for example? So you have an overgrowth of, re of yeast. How is our increasing those things like vitamin C play a role in keeping that in check. What happens, the studies showed that if you are deficient in vitamin C's, candida can grow well. So in a way, by providing these vitamins, you are uh, creating an environment which does not support the growth of candida in this way. Understood. It's, uh, it's all seems like such uh, straightforward advice for more people. <laughs> and yet we still are dealing with such an epidemic of Candida and fungal overgrowth. Yeah, and, and the numbers don't lie, right? And so we've all, the, the example I love to give is we've all been stuck in traffic behind the guy on the carbon fiber bike. He's got the Lycra suit, the unbelievable helmet, and he's about 80 pounds overweight. And you're like, dude, you don't need that bike. Lose some weight, you'll just be a little more aerodynamic. When we look at our gut tests who take it, and we get people like, because when people take our gut test, they can also talk to a nutritionist. Right, this is an at-home test that people can do. Right, right. And so people are looking for a silver bullet. They're looking, like you, you were asking earlier about grass-fed beef, and they're asking about these very specific A1, A2, like very specific nuances. And then 50% of people who take our test eat fast food at least once a week. So a lot of times what we find is like people are not – you know, blocking and tackling on the basics before getting into the nuance of these, like, you know what I mean? Very specific things. Highly to be, personalized. Yeah. Like very yeah. optimized, like Olympian type diet changes, you know, there, and, and it's like anything. It's a lot of times, you know, people will ask us, well, should I be taking this probiotic? Or should I be, and we're saying, don't even worry about supplements till you get your diet in check. Cause they That's should be step one. Step one. These are dietary supplements. Your diet should be driving the bus. But you know, yeah. also as we, as we mentioned before, lifestyle. You need to sleep better. Try to sleep better. Try right. to exercise. Instead of trying to get your diet like two percent better. Yes. How's your sleep? Is it happening consistently? Yeah, because let's just talk about that for a second. 
how does sleep have an impact when it comes to either a microbiome or a microbiome, for example? You know, I mean, in a way, sleep, when you are not sleeping well, you are going to affect the brain, you know, your, your uh, uh, chemicals in your brain and this sort of thing. And if that, if there is some imbalance in, in your metabolism, this is, have been shown to affect the, the, the gut. So the there gut-brain is, connection. Uh, you got brain connection, and it's bidirectional. So if you have an issue, you are not sleeping well, you are so exhausted, your, your function is not doing well, you are going to have imbalance in your, in your gut. Uh, and, th- and that, when you have this imbalance, you are going to have the gas- uh, gastrointestinal issues. Mm-hmm. And it's the other, the other way. If you have uh, imbalance in your gut, what, what it showed, it showed that you can change some chemicals in the brain, like serotonin, for example, which again affect your mood. mood, mood. So it's it's really a very uh, sensitive balance you need to try to adjust, but it is not that difficult if you have the will and you select your food, you try to change slowly uh, with respect to your exercise, with respect to your uh, sleep, uh, your uh, stress, you know, go out, hike, do, you know, do some meditation. I can, I give you a laugh. I, I started, you know, for somebody like who come from uh, Lebanon to start doing yoga, this is something unbelievable. <laughs> mm-hmm. My mom would, wouldn't uh, like that, I'm sure. But <laughs> guess what? It is great. And it works. It works, it relaxes you, and then it helps you uh, along the way. So, so when you first came to this country and you started doing your research in this space, it was really under the umbrella of infectious disease yes. to get the funding that you needed. Yes. When did you realize that there were implications in your research that were at the sort of consumer level? When did that aha moment come that like, whoa, like people can actually do something about this and that can improve their health? You know, this was about maybe 10 years ago now. Uh, since we started, because I used to go to these meetings, you know, scientific meeting, American Society for Microbiology, and the, and I sit and listen to people, and they're talking about bacteria, 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 and then I said, you know, it must be fungi is important. And finally, when I first came to the U.S., I went to a meeting, it's called Candida and Candidiasis. Mm-hmm. So obviously the organism and the disease that caused by Candida. And there was one... Uh, physicians talking about we really need to look at ye- the yeast syndrome. You know, this like a lot of the a lot of the time he said everything happens it's because of yeast. You know, which is really o- overblown. It's not true. There are certain things which happens uh, which are caused by yeast, but nobody listened at that time. But people I weren't paying attention back then. Be- paying attention at all. And then when I started looking into the fungus and I started to see that by changing. For example, in our first study with uh, HIV-infected patients, by seeing that there is one organism, its presence could affect the candida, which is the bad one, I thought, oh, there may be some ways where we can manipulate this. And the whole thing coalesced when we looked at Crohn's disease patients. And that's that's when it really became apparent. That became clear that, oh my goodness, we really can do something about that. So Afif, you know, you are, your dad's son, and you are just living your life, going about it, right? Hanging out with friends, going to school. At one point in time, were you aware of your dad, like really like this micro, you know, microbiome? And then when did that turn into, okay, my dad is now showing through his research, this is important. Pharmaceuticals tend to only pay attention to things that they can patent, but people still need solutions for it. Take us through that journey. Yeah, so uh, I, not shockingly, I hear a lot from my dad. Oh, I published this really exciting paper. I'm like, oh, that's awesome, <laughs> right? Like, but it 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 it's typically like very interesting in the scientific community, right, or the academic community, right? Kind of ivory towerish. So in 2016, he published his paper on Crohn's, and he's saying, oh, this is a big paper. I'm like, that's awesome. And then literally, Case Western School of Medicine got thousands of people reaching out trying to get a hold of him, and it was people from around the world who had someone dealing with Crohn's, and they were saying like, how can I figure this out. Like I, I, and one woman in particular, Forbes covered, okay. covered this, she wrote a letter and it was like upsetting to read it. And it was basically like she had two sons that had Crohn's. She, she had trekked all over Europe trying to find a solution. And she was begging my dad, could you test their guts? 
And his lab was not set up for that. His lab is set up for like heavy duty NIH funded clinical trials. And I said to him like, this is insane. Like you're doing this type of research and this poor woman can't access it. Like that does not make sense. And when we looked in the market, we said, you know, no one is talking about this dual role of bacteria and fungi. So we launched Biome. And the whole point was just to basically take out of the ivory tower what he was doing. And to this day, the testing we do is the exact testing he's been doing for NIH. And it's not just the testing, but it's also the solutions for it. So right. it's having, yes. everybody's talking about what probiotic to take, what probiotic right. to take, but being one of the first companies or the first company yeah. that's taking fungi yeah. and probiotic in the right relationship to have the most bang. Yeah, so when we look, these people are asking specifically, like how can I address biofilms in, in the gut? Like I read your research, and we look and we said, there's no one who's addressed this, like with any evidence, right? So when we, we created Biome and we specifically created it to break down this matrix of the biofilm. So using, as dad said, correlation analysis, we found what are these organisms creating the biofilm? What probiotic organisms break down those, those uh, organisms in the biofilm? And wow. if you could do that, you break down, like he said, that the jello, and you can really then get to the pathogenic guys underneath that force field. And you know, it was really amazing uh, how many people co contacted me and start to say, can you help us, what's this? And then I told Afif, you know, I was working in HIV, HIV uh, area and you know, the HIV and AIDS uh, community are very, very close and they are very uh, supportive and passionate. they push for research and passionate, you know, to, to do more and more research to help them. Lo and behold, I, I realized that there are so many people in the U.S. that, and, uh, and worldwide, in fact, that they have got issues. So it became to me, I said, you know, this is really important area to try to, to address and try to do something about it. And that's what keeps us excited because we, uh, we believe uh, that what we are doing is going to help help them and that makes me yeah, happy because as a professor not always you can have your basic research translated but this right, one often anyway, it's just sitting there it says yeah in the community in more discussion yes. and maybe like 30 years later it turns right. into something yeah. well and even like we had commercialized products mainly in oral care basically killing germs right and we'd sold products all over the place and you know i used to joke with dad like there's no like mouthwash survivors, advocates of the world groups, like it's not a thing, right? When you look in the GI, like whether it's Crohn's, whether it's all sorts of issues, people are passionately uh, yeah. into this subject because it, it, it just shocked us when you really look like everybody seems to, or if they don't, someone they know deals with GI issues and it's a very, very passionate community. So one of the articles that's on your uh, website, Dr. G is basically, you know, uh, I forgot the title, but it's like, what does uh, Dr. G eat or what does a researcher eat, right? When you started digging into this space and you started to understand the importance of that symbiotic relationship between the fungi and the bacteria, can you remember of any sort of early changes you were making in your own lifestyle saying, okay, maybe I should change what I'm doing now? You know, I always uh, like to eat fruits and vegetables because I am, you know, from a temperate climate and we have all these fruits and vegetables there, so I'm used to it. But I started to, to eat more uh, maybe celery, so I wanted a little bit more fiber, which uh, we, I, don't, I didn't eat before. I love uh, fish, but I started now to eat more of it uh, than, than before. So I started to change subtly things uh, not to have too too much steak. I mean, the U.S. the steak is great, but I don't think it's great for my microbiome. So even if I go and have some, I make sure I don't have too much. As, as Afif said, moderation. Right, and so, I guess also from your culture, like Lebanese, there'll be like a lot of lamb. Of course, a lot of lamb, a lot of hummus. You know, like all this uh, tabbouleh, which is a lot of uh, cracked wheat. Uh, uh, cucumber, tomatoes, and this sort of things. They are all good type of food, basically, uh, that is gonna support your uh, gut mi microbiome, both bacteria and fungi. And Afif, how about for yourself? You know, on a practical level, when you look at all this stuff, were there things that you started modifying differently in your approach when it came to uh, trying to support the, the fungi? Yeah, so definitely being more aggressive about being focused on plant-based diet and then definitely cutting out red meat. Like that's the one that when you look at 
sort of the overwhelming evidence, not just in the microbiome, but just overall that like plant based, it's like Michael Pollan's like eat plenty of plants, some meat, not a lot type approach. So I've become a lot more conscious because, you know, to be honest, a lot of our consumers are very passionate and they're trying to make these adjustments. So, you know, for us, it became a lot more personal about making these adjustments ourselves. But it's still, listen, it's still a work in progress. Like other things, like, you know, we talk about the stress, like that's something that we definitely both probably need to work on, you know? So it's it's always being multifactorial. There's always things that can be optimized, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the other thing that I, I always uh, exercise, but now I really make it uh, every morning I wake up, I do the elliptical, um, and I I do uh, stretches because of the yoga. I make you laugh. I used to watch the news. Now I don't watch the news. I watch I Love Lucy or mm -hmm. <laughs> something something very very uh, uh, comedy type. Something relaxing. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you you start the day stressed out. So it's better just relax. Try to uh, do your exercise. Don't kill yourself. But uh, that really will, will work very well. Also, I start to change at work. I don't use now elevators. I, I go up the stairs. So it's, it's quite good. How do environmental factors or the products that we use affect beneficially or positively the, the microbiome? We hear a lot of people coming on the podcast before, and we had this wave, especially in like the 80s and the early 90s of like antibacterial, kill everything, you know, overdo this, hand sanitizer everywhere. I think this is really not a good way to go. I tell you why, because we have a live example which happened in the Netherlands where they use a lot of antifungals to uh, spray plants. And guess what happens? And why specifically in the Nether Netherlands? Just Be for context. Uh, just for con That's where the first paper came out because it seems, especially with tulip and this sort of thing, they use so much oh, for the floor, for flowers, the, for the flowers. To protect them. They use a huge amount of antifungals. antifungals, and lo and behold, they started to see infection caused by Aspergillus, one of the fun fungi, which is mold basically. And next step, patients start to be the, to have disease with Aspergillus, and then when they did DNA typing, they found the same strains that were in the tulip, for example, they were infecting this, this patient. Mm. So that's why I really think we don't need to kill everything as far as microorganisms are concerned, because in a way we are encouraging the resistance, both bacteria and fungus. And also it's no doubt these, some of these chemicals will also affect us if we have a lot of, for example, meat, which where the cows have been given so huge amount of antibiotics, you know, all of this affect our health. So from my point of view, I think it's, if you can get organic as much as possible will be helpful. I know it's a challenge sometimes because it's not cheap, but try to uh, select better choices than things which really are environmental. And reducing household cleaners and the chemicals that we're yes. being exposed to, those things also wreak havoc on our no doubt about it. That's why like, uh, there is a study where people who live in farms where they don't use all of these, guess what? Their children don't have as much allergy as people who live in the city with all Purell all, always in their hand. Yeah. So definitely uh, organisms are not our enemy. In a way, I, I, I advocate that let people play in the dirt a little bit because that's good because our body and their immune system will get trained to face these organisms if they come and infect you. Well, and even households that have pets are a lot more healthy just because the animals coming in and out of the house. Yeah. Like this idea of, again, it comes back to this, this, and a lot of it's a marketing message. It's very simple to explain. Bad germs, get rid of them. Good germs, encourage them, right? And it's really, you, you these, these all live in an ecosystem. So you, something will give if you're getting rid of one community, right? So when you're killing all these bad organisms, something's going to be off, right? And you're seeing it. So I want to give a plug to Biome and some of the stuff that you guys are up to because it's very rare that the the researchers work directly influences like immediately the so closely the expression of, of products. A lot of products that are out there are done on on sort of what I would call like borrowed research or associative 
research. So especially when it comes to probiotics, you'll find a lot of strains that are on the market that are used specifically for maybe they're recommending it for a general probiotic, but it's only treated for, it's only studied for diarrhea and playing an influence there or only specifically in like Crohn's patients. So how did you guys go about in terms of selecting what products are beneficial to most people? How did you go about selecting the strains and the types of things that go into the bacteria and the, and the fungi and the products that you have at Biome? Yeah, so our generation one, because our generation two is coming down the pipeline, which I think you'll get a kick out of, but generation one was literally looking at what are these pathogenic organisms and let me take a step back. A lot of products are developed just the way you said. They find either an interesting ingredient and maybe there's a small clinical trial and they sort of cobble it together in a formula and they market it, right? We work backwards. We said, okay, what are we trying to address? We think biofilms need to be broken down. Okay, what are in those biofilms, these pathogenic organisms? How do we inhibit those specific organisms? So then what we then did was sourced strains in the U.S., that would actually inhibit those organisms plus the digestive enzyme. And that became our biome formula. So then we did clinical trials, but we started from a very targeted formulation based on what he had seen in these Crohn's clinical trials. So that's that's how we- That's exactly, I mean, that's how science really led us. The first thing is we looked at Crohn's disease patients. We found what is there. Then we knew that because we compared the family members with Crohn's versus their same uh, people who are living in the same like uh, uh, brothers or sisters uh, that don't have Crohn's. And we compared the two and we knew that this these organisms in the Crohn's the disease patient that cause issue. So the first thing we, we identified what is there. And then we knew what they are doing because clearly they have gastrointestinal uh, issues. So the se- third step is, okay, how can we try to prevent them. And that's where we did the correlation analysis and we did targeted really uh, research to try to inhibit E. coli, which is known to be pathogen, Siracia marcissans, also another bacteria which is known to cause infection, and of course, Candida, which is really the number one uh, pathogen as far as uh, fungi is concerned. So when we did that and we said, okay, they are these organisms, they come together, what do they do? And when we put them together, we had strains from our collection. We have thousands of strains of clinical isolates, and we put them together, and lo and behold, they made biofilms. And then when they make biofilm, we said, okay, not only they are there, they are making this biofilm which protected them. So our now aim or objective is to try to break these biofilms. And that's how we selected the strains as well as added the enzyme because we thought this also will give a helping hand for the strains. And that's how we came out with Biome. So, you know, you both have like a biotech link and a background and a connection. Sometimes pharmaceutical companies get a really bad rap because it feels like they're only in it to make money. They're not necessarily like in the in the good graces of the public right now, especially with everything that's happening with like the opioid crisis, the viewpoint is negative. But pharmaceutical companies have also created some life-saving drugs that we wouldn't be here. One of the conversations that comes up is that they don't pay attention to a lot of these solutions because there's not a patent or something that they can own there, but you guys have a link into it. Do you see the pharmaceutical companies starting to pay attention a little bit more? Are they looking for these solutions that are out there? You know, this is so interesting. I just, last week, I was at ID Week, Infectious Disease Week, where everybody in infectious disease, they come together and pharmaceutical companies were there. And I knew some of them, I I helped them uh, right, to develop, develop their drugs. So we were talking, they say, hey, Mahmoud, what are you up to? I say, well, I am doing now microbiome, mycobiome, my my specialty. And they, it's amazing. I'm not gonna mention names of the companies, but big pharma. They say, you know, we are watching, we want to come in, but we really don't know quite yet. It's like the dot com. You know, when it was the dot we com started. We know the going to be big. Every, we, we they knew know it's big, but they don't have. But <laughs> I, I came, I told Afif, you know, Afif, I think this is going to be a very hot area because people are going to come in because they know they are starting to see that these non-therapeutic approaches or non-pharmaceutical approaches is helping people. So I think they will come in. And, and 
they are already coming in in one aspect. And to your point, like pharma gets a generally a very bad rap. But one of the things they're you're seeing the Pfizer's of the world and how they're entering the market a lot of times is they're acquiring brands, right? And what we've seen because we do actually supply other products with microbiome testing, microbiome ingredients. What we've seen is that with the entry of the pharma companies into the space, the quality levels on manufacturing supply chain have gone through the roof. So what you would have gotten in a bottle 10 years ago, it's not even comparable to the standard now. And that's because pharma came in and really everybody's applying, starting to apply pharma level quality. You know, Manufacturing the, the, standards, exactly, approaches, right. sources yeah. of ingredients, because still dietary supplements overall exactly. are unregulated. Exactly. Uh, totally. totally. And totally. you know what's so interesting, even at the science side, the National Institute of Health, now putting what you call RFA, request for applications for people to put grants to study probiotics because they want to know what, how useful are these? Are they effective? So this is good news because they are putting money into this area of research, which definitely gonna lead to new understanding and better management of this area where we are gonna end up with good products. It's similar to, as you said, with so many products uh, that pharmaceutical companies produced before. I think this is where it's going now. Yeah, we're also seeing in the space of, we had uh, Dr. Roland Griffiths, who's a researcher in the space of psilocybin and its impact on depression or end of, li end of life depression or people who have severe addiction. Mm -hmm. So he's at Johns Hopkins and he's doing a lot of research on how magic mushroom psilocybin can severely impact and curb addiction when it comes to smoking secession, which is one of the hardest addictions to break. They've seen some incredible things that are there. And he's working with pharmaceutical companies to see, can we turn this into something that can be applied in, to individuals? You said this earlier, and one of the biggest challenges is gonna be pharma companies are gonna have a hard time getting into the space without knowing that they have something that's protectable because these guys pour just the way the regulations are set up with FDA, it, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, to get a drug through approvals. So these guys are only gonna invest in that if they know they have protection. And that's a double-edged sword, right? They bring all this innovation, R&D efforts, but you know it also builds a moat where all of a sudden things that were generally accessible, maybe in a, in a supplement context, or obviously psilocybin, not so much supplement context, but you know, all of a sudden you're gonna have a lot of regulations, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. So you're seeing it, for example, in fecal transplants, right? So that obviously is basically cataclysmic changing uh, situation with C. diff mm -hmm. and these things, but the regulations haven't been there. So guess what? Over the summer, you see a couple clinical trials where people die, right? Mm -hmm. Because the quality is not consistent and that is only gonna prompt you know, pharma making the case that you need us doing this because of the quality, because of safety. And again, that's a double-edged sword because all of a sudden something that was generally available, maybe at a lower cost, probably will have prices hike up, but that's the trade-off, right? And potentially side effects in the implementation. Totally. Sure. You know, I think it's like 80%, 85% of pharmaceuticals come from plant compounds. And of course yes. they're made at a much higher dosages and concentrations or isolations yeah, that are there. Yeah. And sometimes there's side effects. And we all are just trying to make the best decision we can. Exactly. There's life, saving, life changing and saving drugs that are out there. But that's where the physician comes in. Like right. you see in the opioid crisis, like a lot of, there's something, some crazy stuff, like 85% of pain uh, prescriptions where an opioid was prescribed, it was more appropriate to have like Tylenol, right? So the problem is, you know, these things all have a role, like a, even fentanyl when properly used is, you know, a, a proper medication. But the problem is these things, you know, you, you need gatekeepers. I think it's you good to have, it's good to have, from my point of view, it's good to have regulation so that they, you know, basically the FDA is after safety first. Totally. I think this is good. Uh, like sometimes it is awkward. They, they make you do things which are really not necessary. But in general, if you take it the total uh, picture, I think, it's important to have FDA. Otherwise, we are gonna have things which are not really efficacious and could be dangerous. So totally. I think it's a good thing. Absolutely, and it's so uh, it's all part of the greater research and we're part of that too. Diet is part of that too. Exactly. Raising awareness is part of that too. People yeah. wouldn't pay attention to this if we didn't do 
podcast, if there weren't consumer stories, if there wasn't individuals out there saying that, hey, anecdotally in my N of one, I started to feel better taking this. I started to see improvements that are, are there. And most importantly, like you're talking about in your new book, Total Gut Balance, Fix Your Microbiome Fast for Complete Digestive Wellness, there are so many practical things that we can all do today without pharmaceutical intervention yes. to improve our digestive health and to have a better relationship between our microbiome and microbiome. Absolutely, absolutely. When did you get the idea that you wanted to now go from research, which has inspired a product company, to I gotta write a book? <laughs> you know, uh, when uh, again, when I pu- published that paper, I started to think the Crohn's disease the, one the Crohn's where everybody disease, reached out and the, yes that's the paper and then another paper where the uh, uh, journal M Bio contacted me and said we'd like you to write an opinion piece about uh, this what's going on with the biofilm and this sort of thing and then when I wrote that uh, and put it together I realized you know there are we should have some ways to try to control this and that's where I, more and more data started to appear about how diet can influence the microbiome. And then I said, okay, we really need to think to balance not only the bacteria, but all the fungi. And that will require a lot of research, a lot of data bring, brought together to see how can we shift the balance in our favor rather than against us. And that's when I decided, let's put a book together because it's amazing how much information you can put uh, and you see, wow, this is gonna work. You know, the interesting thing is once we put the diet together, we really did a test. We had people uh, enrolled in the study. Like a beta, beta, beta for the book? Beta for the book because we wanted to see, okay, does it really make Works. a difference, right. you know? And to our delight, uh, it really made a difference. You know, people who have GI issues, they uh, resolve. P- some people who had low energy, they they be, they really have increase in energy, less fatigue. Other people slept better. And really to our also surprise, people lost weight up to 10 uh, pounds in four weeks. So that was really uh, a, an eye opener that, okay, this diet, proof that if you can change the microbiome, you will be able to have less inflammation, lose weight, and be well. And you know, it's so interesting <laughs> when, we, when we put all, all uh, this together, I thought, oh my goodness, that's really very pleasing because again, as I mentioned before, as a professor, you do all these basic science and then suddenly this is really applied to people and you can see people are doing better. So that's yeah. it. Yeah. Afif, you were involved in the book and putting it together and supporting your dad and getting his research out there. What's something that you learned yourself in the process of putting this together? Because a research trial and all the great work that your dad does is great and it's for academia and that's important. That's what this all is based off of. But then you have to turn it into a consumer application, something that people can read and then implement. Anything you anything new you learned in putting uh, in helping your dad put this book together? Well, one of the things I've learned is don't assume what you know in what you're doing every day is just common knowledge. That's one of the hardest things I think when you know dad and I are going back and forth like ten times a day. We talk all the time that a lot of things we just take for granted that that he's aware of or, or we know that's something that we need to make sure is accessible because if the message is it doesn't matter if like he's published all this work doesn't matter if it's not accessible and understandable to, to the audience the main thing i learned was honestly the the shift how how fast it can shift on the fungi because i obviously i knew there were different communities i i did not appreciate how sort of entrenched bacteria is in the equation versus fungi you know, the other thing which I didn't mention in the trial, in addition to looking at their symptoms and how they improved, we also took uh, stool samples before at baseline and at the end, and we were able to show that there is shift in both the bacteria and the fungi towards better profile. So this is in a way, it, not, it proves that by shifting the structure of the microbiome, you are going to have better health uh, Yeah. And the other thing, Dad, that we've learned through all the gut testing that we've done is that everybody thinks and it seems that because 
it's not like your genetics, your microbiome can change. If some, if your genetics change, you, you were in the wrong place. Like something went awfully <laughs> wrong. Right. Um, but even though it's dynamic and can shift about 98% of people that have taken our test fall into one of a number of clusters pretty predictably. That surprised me because I really had the impression it's almost like a fingerprint that it's everybody's individually. It, it's not. The vast majority of people fall in the predi predictable clusters. And that was something that I think even you were a little surprised Yeah, yeah, about. because people think like we are all individual, like you, every one of us have his own microbiome. There are some uh, personal variation, but really when you put it all together, we looked at ab about a thousand person who are quote unquote healthy, they are not taking antibiotics, they don't have any health issues or antifungal, they don't uh, are on any medications. And we tried to compare their profiles, we, you know, uh, PCA analysis, uh, it's called. Uh, and we, show, we saw that there are three different groups of people out of these thousand. You know, one group is the uh, biggest and then two other. That's with respect to the bacteria. But what's so interesting, these th three different groups could have plus fungi or no fungi, you know, with respect to candida in particular. So now, we, in a way, we have personalized approach, but instead of having each individual person to group of people, which really uh, was fascinating. Incredible. And uh, another plug for the book comes out on December 24th. It's an opportunity to learn for people to dive deep into the world of the microbiome, but with really like practical solutions that are available for them to begin to understand not only why it's important, but how they can take control of it and start to have that better relationship between the microbiome and the, and the microbiome. Um, I want to talk about and share a, a really cool story that uh, was recently featured, uh, I believe in NPR, right? Yes. You know, your work, you're an immigrant to this country and when you first uh, came here, all this work is built on this idea of how you started your career. But if it wasn't for one very special person who helped you in that process, uh, none of this might have happened or maybe you would have been in a different area. Sure. So yeah. I would love to just tell that story just briefly. It's such a feel good story. Uh, if either one of you. Yeah, let, would let me show off for him because he <laughs> so. We, we actually were living in Kuwait up till 1990 and during my mom's English. And so we would go to England every year. And during 1990 was obviously the invasion of Kuwait. So we went from fun summer vacation to literally everything in two suitcases. So my dad had been uh, that summer invited to a conference on like the medicinal uses of garlic in DC. <laughs> and this is 1990. There's no like Just any old conference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> it was the first uh, uh, Congress on the biology of garlic. Right. Who was the host? The garlic? Uh, right, right, uh, right. I think there were some people, the organizer, <laughs> I forgot now, but I know the organizers were, were from California. <laughs> okay, got it. The garlic sure. growers yeah, of California. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, and again, this is like pre like Expedia, like he had a set of tickets, right? Like already said to him and he said to my mom, like, and there's three of us living, you know, we, we lost everything. I was 10, my sister's six, my brother's like, because of the infant, war, because of the war. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it'd been on the local news in England and we had nowhere to live. Right. Because like assets are frozen, like this is nothing. Right. So a local university gave us a dorm for us to live in. So my dad said to my mom, like, I have this ticket to this conference. Like, let me see if I can get a job. Right. So, gets to Washington, and again, like, this is the part, at, like, I'm his age now, 39, when he was going through this, and I can't oh, imagine maybe. things like, there's no credit cards, there's no, like, PayPal, there's nothing, right? Yeah. So he had a little no, bit of money. No, nothing. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, he's telling me about this later, but, like, literally, like, apples in the conference type stuff, right? So he's asking everybody, he and my mom recreated his Circulum Vitae, his resume, and he's going around this conference in DC, he's like, look, are you guys hiring? And all the guys are like the working scientists, like lab, like technicians. They say, you know, we're not really the people that hire people. There's a conference next week, actually in DC. That's the one you have to be at, right? So he's totally despondent because there's like, he's headed back to London the next day and there's no job, there's no money, like no nothing, right? So he's walking around DC and he sees his travel agency. So he walks in and um, 
you know, we joke that my dad, like with his accent, if he goes to Taco Bell, we'll get six hamburgers. Like, he, you know, <laughs> so this is like 30 years ago. He walks in and he says to this guy, like, I, I need your help. I need you to change this ticket and I, and I can't pay you. Right. Because he had a friend in, in Milwaukee. Milwaukee. So he's like, if I can just get there again, there's no cell phone like Rick. I, I need to stay like I, I'm just going to show up in Milwaukee and, and figure out my next move. Right. So he says, I need you to change this ticket for me. The guys, it's like, I, I can't do that. I, I, you know, I'd lose my job. My dad's like. I'm struggling. I need your help. Right. And he told the guy the story for like a couple hours. Guy reaches into his wallet. He pays for my dad's ticket change. And then he gives my dad 80 bucks. Like, so my dad could like basically get a taxi and stuff. Dad goes to Milwaukee, comes back to DC, gets two job offers and ended up, we came to here LA and he was at UCLA. So this is this store. This guy changed our life. Right. Incredible. Yeah. Act like, of kindness. It, oh, yeah. Right? And again, like oh. I think of my, I'm literally my dad's age on this happened. I think, you know, I'd like to think I would do it, but that's a big ask if someone was like, can you pay hundreds of dollars? Like you're a stranger. I don't know. Maybe this guy's real name is Larry and he's from, you know, Fort Lauderdale. Like, you know what I mean? Like, is it a scam? You don't know. Right. So this like kind of became a family legend, right? And we tell this story, uh, this travel agent and people would always ask like, well, do you know who the guy is? And we're like, no, you know, we, we don't. What happened know? to him? Yeah. You know, so literally probably like a month and a half ago, someone asked and they're like, well, that's really stupid. Like, find this guy, right? So I literally put a Facebook post and I just put like all caps, like were you in a uh, travel agent in DC in 1991? And I described the story. It gets shared like a thousand times and the Washington Post sees it. So they reach out and uh, you know, they verify everything, get, get a hold of us. I'm like, whoa, you know, and dad's background like as a scientist. So they write an article and the second comment, this woman's like, this is my boss. His name was Jimmy, it's making me like upset even thinking about it. This, this guy's name's Jimmy Dorsey, right? So they sent us a picture of this, you know, older African American dad's like, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's him. Uh, get a hold of his wife. She sends us pictures, and my dad starts like crying, like this is him, right? And so we it. track oh this guy God. down. He had passed away six months ago. Oh my god! So we miss this guy by six months, but like it has been the biggest blessing because you know, it, it, and someone said this to me, like if someone in you are close to passes away and someone tells you a funny story that you've never heard about him, like it feels great. These people, they, 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 their families, like multiple stories in the Washington Post about like he's our angel, like he's a you know just really, and, and the guy was like a volunteer firefighter. He's just a good person, right? And the craziest part is his niece lives three streets down from my parents in Cleveland. Oh my He's, gosh. The guy's it's originally from Cleveland. Your destiny is it's like oh yeah. It's yeah, it was unbelievable. So we're actually going to go visit uh, his wife and his kids in a couple of weeks. But it was like, you know, just insane. It's unbelievable. Like I now I I told Afif, you know, like it's not like if you stop and you rationally think about it, would you do it? I don't think you'll do it. And I think that it's you not know, just the money just, aspect. A lot of people are just on edge and they're worried. Yeah. About, is this person scamming me? Is, it, yeah, yeah, is this going to yeah. be something else? Yeah. You know, and so we're just so sometimes through society, the situation, you may not have time yeah. because you're yeah. really busy. I told them, I uh, I told Afif and the family, you know, when I got the jobs and I was on my way back to England because I had to wait for my visa to come back to the U.S., you know, to UCLA, uh, I was crying because I could not believe it. Like I could get a job, uh, you know, uh, at that time. So... One person. Uh, we are very like a new human. Changed a generation it, for. It really did. It really multiple did. generations for yeah. a family. A hundred percent. Because England's like one of those places too. It's tough if you're not ingrained in that society. Like, you, you can't. You know, it's not like you. That's the one thing people don't realize about the U.S. Like, it is possible. It's not easy to make it, but like, my yeah. God, it, everybody has a shot. You know, and that's all. That that's what that guy gave us was a shot. Yes. You know, and it was. It's, it shows, you know, we are all a human being. And then if you do something uh, that impacts somebody's life, it's it's unbelievable. Like, it's just uh, great. What a beautiful message to end on there. And Thank just you. this idea of spreading kindness. No because that also, it. I'm sure, positively impacts the microbiome, sure. the microbiome, <laughs> right? right? Being a happy person, yes. being real. And I know people who don't have the best diets in the world but they're so committed to service. They're so committed to giving back. Yeah, yes. You know, they're so committed to being there for the people. And that's a big part of their purpose. And they're happy and they're content, content. And most importantly, they're making the world a better place. Really and that's why our diets and these things are great. 
we do all that stuff so we can go and give back so we can make a difference so we can change people's lives it's not just to see, get the award of who can be the healthiest. Right. Yes, exactly. Right? It's to actually make a purpose yeah. and a difference in this planet. I really agree. I always say, look, we are all human beings. We are all trying to have the same thing and do the same thing. We need to take care of our kids. We want to educate them. We need to, you know, just make sure you, uh, they have good health and this sort of thing. But that's, a, I travel, as you know, around the world and everywhere you go, human beings are human beings. And that's what's so beauty. Uh, of this world. Incredible. Afif, Dr. G, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Where can people find out more about you? And um, and you also have a course coming up, like yeah. a master's class. Yeah, so I'd yeah, love yeah. for you to just give a couple mentions for the Absolutely. company, for the book, where people can find all this and social media. Absolutely. So for Biome, just biomehealth.com, B-I-O-H-M health.com. And that's where we have our probiotics and our, our gut tests. Uh, for his site and the book, drmicrobiome.com, drmicrobiome.com, or on Amazon, it's uh, Total Gut Balance is the book. Um, and then on the course, drmicrobiome.com, really that's for people that the book is going to be interesting to them, but these are people that want like a helping hand, like a personalized approach, one-on-one -on -one help to actually optimize their diet see exactly how to really do things in, in a group coaching with nutritionist type setting. Incredible. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Can't wait for the book to be out there and appreciate you both. And thank you for coming thank on you the so Broken much. Brain Podcast. And, and, and the last both. thing I'll say is serious thank you to you, Drew, because since day one, when honestly we were just building our relationship, you were just incredibly helpful and we honestly won't ever forget that seriously thank you thank you very much for thank you it's been a pleasure i couldn't i cannot beat this guy his english is better than mine <laughs> <laughs> thank well you. the sentiment is deeply felt and i'm excited for the impact that your work will continue to make right, thank, thank, you. thank you both All right, thank take you. care